Hello and welcome back to my world of stuff. It's time to take a look at my top 10 TV shows of the year. And I promise this video will be a lot shorter than my top 10 movies where I got very carried away talking a very long time about the films and the runners up. I've got runners up here, but I'm not going to go on and on about them. I'll just go through my top 10 in reverse order. Again, I will have to say I haven't watched everything that's been on TV. I've watched a lot of stuff. I've watched a lot of genre stuff. As you'll see, I've watched quite a bit of non-genre stuff as well. But these are the shows that really made me go, wow, this is this is bold and different. And this is doing something with the medium of television, which a lot of shows, particularly British sort of detective and police procedural type things, don't really do. They just go through the motions of there's been a murder and investigating it. And I, you know, I like British shows. that have got something else about them. And there's a few of them on this list. So let's crack on with my number 10 in my TV listings. And it is... It's Nolly. Now, this will be quite a surprise. This is a three-part drama which I think aired on ITVX back in February. And it's actually on ITV over the Christmas uh, period. This is by Russell T. Davis. It's a three-part serial about Noel Gordon, played by Helena Bonham Carter in this particular little series, who was the matriarch of TV back in the 60s, the star of Crossroads, the cheap and cheerful uh, Midland soap opera based around the Crossroads Motel. Noel played Meg Richardson, later Meg Mortimer, the, I say, the matriarch who ran this motel with her daughter Jill and her son Sandy and various other characters who came in. And it was a massive hit from about 1964 when it started until the 80s when it started to get a bit tired and worn out. And Nolly is basically a three-part story about how this actress, Noel Gordon, who a lot of people out there will never have heard of, will have totally forgotten about, she was this queen of TV and she was suddenly dethroned by a new producer who just axed her from the series and she never knew why and it was never publicly known why and it was a story that Russell T Davis became fascinated in and he created this lively life-affirming drama about this tragic story of this woman who had it all and then had it taken away from her terrific performance from Helena Bonham Carter great supporting cast from the likes of Con O'Neill, Mark Gatiss uh, it's a really good, solid cast, and it very vividly recreates that that period of TV in the sixties and seventies. And it's it's a damn good drama, and of course it's Russell D Davies, so you know it's a good script. And I just thoroughly enjoyed it. I think binged it over one night. It was three episodes, and as I say, unusually perhaps for me, it's the sort of thing that you might not necessarily expect me to be raving about. But I thought it was a really good story, and I do like Russell T Davies's writing. That comes in at number ten. Number nine is a real pot boiler. This was on, I think, Amazon Prime two months ago. A part thriller called Hijack, starring Idris Elba and Eve Miles, uh, Neil Stook, a big cast of people, Neil Maskell. A uh, really interesting, ra probably rather silly thriller about uh, hijacking on a plane, which is on its way back to the UK from somewhere in the Mediterranean, Turkey or something. It's sort of a terrorist thing, a family drama, but it's very... Exciting. It's an eight, eight episodes. The, this plane gets hijacked. Idris Elba is sort of a negotiator and he's sort of um, go between between the, the crew and the rest of the passengers who are terrified. And he's trying to wait, trying to find a way to persuade the uh, hijackers to cool things down. But it, it all escalates and gets out of control as the episodes roll by. Every episode ends on a cliffhanger. It's a real, it's a real nail biter. It's, it's sort of schlocky in a way. And there's probably huge gaps in logic, but I really enjoyed it. For a British series, it sort of bounced along and it was eight fun episodes with a lot of drama and excitement. A lot of it sort of far-fetched, that's the expression I hate. But if you go along with the ride and suspend your disbelief, it's, it's very entertaining stuff. Two more British, in fact, three, four. There's a lot of British shows actually in this list, I've just realised. Number eight is Boiling Points. This is a very short series, a four-part series that aired on the BBC a couple of months back, based on the film from a couple of years ago of the same name, starring Stephen Graham and Vinette Robinson. And Stephen Graham plays this no-nonsense chef in this upmarket restaurant in, in London, and the film was allegedly filmed in one take. Uh, it's like a one frantic, intense night in this restaurant they're trying to get everything right they're trying to satisfy the customers and yet the lead character played by the brilliant Stephen Graham he's got his own demons he's not healthy he likes a drink 
his life is running out of control. And the film ended in a certain way a few years ago. And then this four-part series arrived a few months back, a couple of months back, four episodes on a Sunday night. And it was all available on the iPlayer to binge, but I chose to watch it weekly because it, sort of, it was that sort of show. It was a bit of a weekend treat. And this time, uh, Stephen Graham takes a bit of a backseat and he's sort of recuperating from something that happens at the end of the film. And Vinette Robinson has got her own, the brilliant Vinette Robinson, who you might know from the Doctor episode Rosa where she played Rosa Parks she's an excellent actress and now turning up in lots of things she's got her own restaurant but it's struggling a little bit you know it's, it's trying to find its feet there are financial issues behind it keeping it going she's also trying to look after her elderly mother played by Kathy Tyson and there's a lot of things putting her in different directions and there's, it's all about the the red hot environment of the kitchen and, and uh, tempers fraying and, and that sort of it's very tense for a drama that's not traditionally exciting, it's very tense and very nerve-wracking in a way because, you, you know, everybody's nerves are frayed, everybody's at each other's throats, but they're a team. And it's, I think it, it reminded me a little bit of days when I worked in a team, although we never had these sorts of things going on. It reminds me of that sort of bond that you have with the people that you're working with. Sometimes you don't get on, sometimes you snap at each other, but you're great friends at the end of the day, you go out together and you do things. And it's all about Vinette Robinson's character trying to keep this thing together. It doesn't have the one-take gimmick, if you like, of the film, but it's certainly uh, it's, it's gripping stuff, and I'm hoping there's going to be a second series. All on the iPlayer now, that's boiling point. Number seven on my list is Happy Valley. Yeah, we haven't got any fantasy television yet. Happy Valley. This is the third and final series of Sally Rain Wainwright's Peerless uh, police drama set up north, starring Sarah Lancashire as Catherine Kaywood, this uh, dogged, determined, very experienced police officer who in the third series is approaching retirement. And the running three theme across the previous two series is this local villain, uh, Tommy Lee Royce who is now in prison, but he killed her daughter, uh, Catherine's daughter, many years ago. And he's sort of constantly popping up in her life and, and balancing her life. And this happens in a major way in this third series, which leads to the final sort of confrontation between the two of them, where they, have, they both have lots of old scores to settle because neither of them are the same person that they were when this happened years ago. A terrific series. And there was one particular episode which was possibly the most extraordinarily well-written and well-acted scene I've seen on television this year. If you've seen this series, you know what I mean. It's when uh, Catherine is betrayed by her sister and sort of confronts her surreptitiously at first and then um, creeps up on her. It's beautifully performed. And so, you know, it is one of those scenes. Again, it's not a big, exciting action scene, but it's a dramatic moment between two super powerful actresses with superb material just playing off each other. And oh, it's just fantastic television uh, not to be missed that's uh, Happy Valley the third and final series okay let's get into some fantasy stuff for number six um, I wasn't sure about putting this in but I did have a lot of fun watching this recently it's the Lazarus Project the second series of the Lazarus Project this is the British time travel science fiction series created by Joe Barton which was a bit of a hit first time round last year second series was rushed into production but you wouldn't necessarily tell. The basic premise of the series, if you've watched it and if you've read anything I've written about it in Starburst, it's about this organisation called the Lazarus Project, which has the ability to turn back time and when an apocalyptic event takes place, a nuclear explosion, something apocalyptic. They try to stop it, but if they can't, they can roll back time to the most recent July the 1st and time carries on without this apocalyptic event taking place. This story moves even deeper into time travel because um, a rival organisation of Chinese conglomerates of scientists have created an actual physical time machine. And this opens up all sorts of peculiar paradoxes and time travel shenanigans, which is great fun over eight uh, maddening episodes because it really is one of those shows you've got to hang on to and it just drags you along you probably lose track of it in places but there are so many terrific set pieces so many clever timey wine oh, i can't believe i'm saying timey wimey so many clever timey wimey bits that pull you back and forth through time in different eras it's not like the prehistoric times or the victorian times it all takes place within the last 10 years or so but it's very very tense the stakes are very high throughout the entire series 
And Caroline Quentin, I think, gives a standout performance as Wes, who is this hard-faced woman in charge of the Lazarus Project. And she has set off on a course of action in this series that she can't deviate from for the sake of the world. It stars Papa Isaidu as George. He's the sort of the hero of the piece. But it's just very good. It's very labyrinthine and very, you do have to keep your wits about you. And I did enjoy the second series, even though I felt, wow, this is really off the leash now. That came in at number six. Number five, good old Doctor Who's back. Yes, uh, Doctor Who, uh, in the last few years, possibly wouldn't have been on the list. But I think uh, the space of four episodes we've had this year, it's re-established itself. I think in the nation's consciousness, my consciousness, though not that it's ever left. But I think we've had Russell T. Davis back delivering four real crowd-pleasing episodes. Now, I will say, I don't think any of them have established this new type of story that he said he was going to write when he came back to do the series. They're very much traditional Russell T. Davis, big, romping adventures. And I think that's good because it re- it reminds lapsed viewers of what Doctor Who was and they really loved it back in the early 2000s. And hopefully it will bring in a new audience, especially Disney Plus now who are distributing it worldwide. I think he's probably keeping his big powder dry for the series that's coming up in May. But I felt that um, I've enjoyed all four of these episodes. And I felt you'll have seen my most recent review of the Christmas episode. That's one which suggests a, a change of tone of the series. I think it's going to be... Slightly different, which may alienate some hardcore fans, but I just say, hang on. Uh, yeah, it's good to see Doctor Who back and, and pop very popular again. In uh, fourth place, I'm putting Black Mirror, season five of Charlie Brooker's, or is it six? Season six, I think, in fact. Charlie Brooker's fantastic anthology series that came out early this year. And it's easy to forget because it came out a while ago. Five new episodes, which were absolutely Black Mirror back on top form after a disappointing previous run of only three episodes. Black Mirror has always been a series that looks at technology and the potentially dark side of technology and things that might go wrong with technology. This is slightly different. He's sort of readjusted the show a little bit to look at humanity and human nature and how human nature can unbalance people and unbalance the world. There's only one episode, the very first one, which is a slightly comedic episode. Um, which sort of touches on technology going wrong. The rest of them are about people, the dark side of people. And it was a terrific run of episodes. There wasn't a duff one in this run. I thoroughly enjoyed every episode. Black Mirror at number four. Number three is the series I thought, if February I would have said, well, there we are, the top series of the year. But it's number three. It's The Last of Us, starring Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey. This is based on a computer game that I never played again, one of these things. I knew nothing about it. I knew it was an apocalyptic, zombie-ish thing, although it actually isn't zombies as such. It's about this uh, fungal virus thing which sweeps across the earth and brings about the fall of downfall of humanity. Of course, there are still enclaves and pockets of humanity still left in the ruins of cities and so on. And the story is that Pedro Pascal's character has to take Bella Ramsey on a voyage across the country because it's felt that she might have embedded in her DNA some sort of cure to this virus. And over, I think it's six or eight episodes, this magnificent sort of journey that they go on. And it's a typical thing where initially he is wary of her and she's wary of him. And as the episodes go on, they grow to trust each other and rely on each other and believe in each other. Very, it's superb. I mean, there's some visuals, stunning visuals. And I, I'm a sucker for all these collapsed cities and desolated landscapes and all that sort of stuff. I love seeing that sort of stuff depicted. It just looked fantastic in this series. The money was wow, the money was up on the screen. Uh, terrific series. And I would have thought it would have been the top show of the year. And, it, you know, in, in, in another year it would have been. I'm really looking forward to the second series, which I think is either in production or will be soon. We'll probably be out this time next year, I would imagine. That's The Last of Us coming in at number three. Number two is a series called Bodies. This is on Netflix. I referred to it in my recent uh, show and tell video when I had the comic uh, graphic novel adaptation. Fantastic series, eight-part series. Again, British series. We're doing very well, considering that genre stuff isn't our forte a lot of the time. This is an eight-part series based on this graphic novel by the late Cy Spencer, which is set in four different time zones in which the same body, naked, shot through the eye, appears in the same location, four different time zones in London, in Whitechapel. What is the mystery that ties them all together? How is this body in four different time zones? Magnificent Puzzle Box TV series. Again, it's one that you've got to watch. You know, you can't scroll on your phone or do anything else, play a game. You need to watch this show because every every frame means something to the 
larger patchwork of the series. Absolutely fantastic series. It's one that I binged, and it's not something I do very often. Bodies on Netflix, number two. My number one show, Beyond All, Shadow Without, is called Silo. Uh, again, I'm not sure if I've mentioned this on the channel before. Silo is, again, based on a series of books. I think the Hugh Howey's books. The first one's called Wool. And this was the series magnificent world building and that's one of the great things about science fiction when it's done well about world building and how they create a world that you believe in it's set in the future apparently some sort of apocalypse has made life uh, that the surface of the earth uninhabitable so survivors live in this huge silo and they've lived there for generations they live there they work there but they never talk about what happened they never talk about the disaster they never talk about what caused the end of the world and there are some people who think there's something strange going on there's a conspiracy of some sort and they think that there are secrets outside that they want to know about. And uh, it's a sort of a rule of law in the silo that anybody who says they want to go outside has to go outside. When they go outside, they're tasked with cleaning the view screen, which has become grubby outside. And they see this vision of this blasted, almost nuclear sort of landscape of blasted trees. And because the air is poisonous, they sort of collapse and die. But is that exactly what's outside or is that fabrication? Is it an image created to keep the people docile? What a series. I mean, this stars Rebecca Ferguson, who's quickly becoming one of my favourite actresses. You'll know her, of course, as Ilsa Faust in the Mission Impossible series. She's superb in this. She becomes promoted to the sheriff. Uh, and it, I sort of realised, oh, this has become a police procedural in a very different way, though. And she becomes fascinated with the truth about what the silo is and, and what's outside. And she starts to investigate this conspiracy. There's an organisation, a sort of a... I know a, a, a governing organisation which controls what people think about and what they hear about and is very secretive about the past. And she starts to investigate what's going on there behind the scenes. It's terrific that the set design, this massive silo with this circular staircase goes right through the middle and all these rooms. It's beautifully designed the show. Magnificent and, and such so exciting. There's one episode, episode three, I think it is, which is all about stopping the power supply being turned off, one of the boilers or something is overheating and Rebecca Ferguson's character has to stop it. And it's, it's so exciting. There's not fights, there's no action or special effects particularly. It's just about this woman's battle to stop herself burning alive before the power supply goes haywire. It's a terrific series. So creative. And again, it's just, like I said, it's a series that you have to watch all the way through properly. Silo, my number one show of the year. Right, that's my top ten. Uh, I have some runners-up, some uh, you know, worthy mentions. I'm going to mention Frasier, the reboot of the classic 1990s comedy with um, Kelsey Grammer as Frasier Crane. This uh, was rebooted as a 10-episode miniseries on Paramount Plus a couple of months ago. And there was a, a lot of people who were wary of this because certain cast members weren't able to or didn't want to come back. And it was felt that it would unbalance the... the the feel of the show because it was always about Frasier and his brother Niles played by David Hyde Pierce who didn't chose not to come back for this series but this has actually turned out to be a triumph because Frasier now was relocated to Boston where he first appeared in Cheers he's now uh, a lecturer at Harvard and one of his oldest um, um, oldest friends played by um, Nicholas Lindhurst from Only Fools and Horses of course he's there as this jaded booze hound English lecturer, Alan, who is an old friend of Fraser, and we have to accept he was never mentioned before. Fraser's never mentioned him in all the time we've known him, but hey, and uh, he's there, and they play off each other very well. He's the sort of jaded, cynical one, and Fraser's still got a sort of a, a beacon of, of belief in the goodness of his students and people. And there's a supporting character, his son, um, Freddy, and uh, this. It, it takes a few episodes to read. I mean, it's funny from the off, but by about episode four or five, it's it's started to be a bit smooth and the performances are more natural and it's moving quite slickly. I mean, it, no, it's not as good as the original Frasier because that was just peerless. That was just so beautifully observed, so beautifully written. But this is as good a revival as we could have hoped for. Bearing in mind, they've talked about it for years. This is a good new format. And I do like to see a, a sort of a multi-camera studio set sitcom with a live audience laughing. Like, you don't get those these days. And it's so nice to go back. It just looked like an old Frasier series in a new set. So I'm looking forward. It's not been confirmed as a second series, but I can't see any reason why it won't come back. I'm also going to mention a series called Boat Story, which was on BBC One fairly recently. This was from the minds of the Williams brothers, Jack and Harry Williams, who created shows like Missing, 
The Tourist, various other shows over the years. This was a very Tarantino-esque six-part series starring Patterson Joseph and Daisy Haggard. As these two complete strangers who are walking along a beach, they find a boat that's washed up and in amongst the debris is massive cache of cocaine, which gets them all involved, gets them involved with gangsters, various gangsters are after this cocaine, particularly one uh, French gangster, played by a certain name here, who apparently, I believe, appeared in Baptiste and the Missing that the Williams brothers created. Uh, created. And it goes to some very surreal, bizarre places. I mean, it, it is a series, I think, that tries a bit too hard to be different. It's sort of a bit mannered and a bit overpleased with itself, perhaps. But I found the story very gripping. The characterization was excellent. The acting was superb. And it just it sort of pulled me along in it. I mean, I, I think I, I mentioned at the time, I think I said to somebody, uh, I think the Williams brothers were given a Tarantino box set for Christmas because they it, it has that feeling about it. Possibly because it's just not like anything else we see on British television. So I enjoyed that. I don't think it was a massive hit, but I don't think it was particularly well regarded. But I had a lot of fun with it and I enjoyed it. The six episodes were good fun. I also quite enjoyed... Uh, a series called Wolf. This was on early autumn, I think. This was a sort of a home invasion story and also a detective story. It's about this well-to-do uh, family living in a house in the country that gets home invaded by these two slightly bizarre gangsters. We don't know why they're there. We don't exactly know what's happening. We don't know who's ordering them to do this. Uh, it, it's interesting. It, I mean, it's not perfect. It, it sort of drags itself out a little bit. But again, it was something a bit unusual for a BBC. British TV doesn't tend to think much outside the box. I'm glad to see that it is. I recommend it, it's not perfect, but it is enjoyable. It's got some interesting ideas in it. Comedy-wise, comedy has sort of dropped off the radar a bit, which I think is a shame. But I want to mention Inside Number 9, the most recent series of that, which was on a few months back. One more series to go. I do like Inside Number 9, but it really isn't a comedy anymore. Not really. There may be the odd amusing line in it, but it's now very much dark, dramatic stories about the dark side of human nature. It's very rarely laugh-out-loud funny for long. There may be the odd gag in it. And this year they did pull off that um, theme. They do occasionally where they... They pull the rug out from under the audience. If you remember the Halloween one they did a couple of years ago, they have an episode in this series, which is a quiz show hosted by Lee Mack. We're led to believe that um, this is a pilot which is being shown instead of Inside Number 9. Quickly becomes apparent that it isn't. It's something a bit more sinister. It was good fun. And this is the sort of thing I like that they do occasionally. They fiddle around with ways of telling stories. Uh, one more series to come. I think it's being filmed at the moment and that will be on probably in the spring sometimes. I also enjoyed Colin from Accounts. This is an Australian comedy series, about eight episodes, which was a bit of a talking point. And uh, there's a second series on there. This is about a sort of an, an old, slightly older man who meets up with this young, slightly younger girl. It's not a sort of a creepy sort of age difference. And uh, he accidentally knocks over her dog. Um, the dog whose name is Colin from Accounts for some reason. And because of this injury, they help look after the dog. And they have this sort of peculiar relationship that dances around a romance, but whenever it dances around, it sort of bounces away again. Very funny, uh, really laugh out loud funny in places. And um, it became a bit of a, a cult thing when it was aired in the spring last year, I think, or this year, I think. Also, when I mentioned a series called The Consultant, I think this was on Paramount+. Plus. It's hard to keep up. There are so many streaming services. This is one that I almost slipped through the net. I'd almost forgotten about until I looked back at some of this year's TV. This starred Christoph Waltz as the titular consultant who comes in to take control of this organisation that develops computer games when its managing director dies suddenly. No idea who this man is, where he's come from, and the rest of the people in the organisation, some of them decide to investigate and find out who he is. And we never really find out who he is, but it's it's quite creep, quite not creepy, but it's quite unusual and surreal. And uh, Christoph Waltz, of course, delivers another magnetic performance. He always seems slightly, slightly outside of human, and he's very, very good in this. I'm also enjoying at the moment Monarchy Legacy of Monsters. This is airing on again. It's hard to say. I think it's Apple Plus. It's Apple Plus. This is a sort of a series that goes hand in hand with. The legendary, um, legendary monster verse films, the Godzilla King Kong films. There's another Kong Godzilla film out later this year, and it's the, sort of the story about how the organization Monarch came about and the people who investigated the Titans over the years. It's not monster filled. Don't think, don't expect to see lots of monsters, but there are creatures in it. But it's more about the backstory of the people who work for Monarch or who come to work for Monarch. And the final one I'm going to mention. There are probably others that I've forgotten, but I'm going to mention this thing called the Big Door Prize. Again, I can't remember where it's on. 
possibly Paramount. It stars Chris O'Dowd, who you will remember from the IT crowd, who lives with his wife and family in this fairly unremarkable town somewhere in America. And in the local um, drugstore, is suddenly this ca- cabinet or, uh, uh, appears and people can press buttons and they get something which tells them their unfulfilled destiny, what they should have been. Got no idea where this thing's come from, but everybody who gets a card, either they're so far away from what they've been that it causes sort of disillusionment and ups- upset and unrest amongst the community because they're not where they should be. It's sort of darkly comedic. Chris O'Dowd's got great comic timing. It's a bit all over the place in a way, but um, it's it's quite memorable because it's an unusual idea. And I did enjoy watching it. This is a second series on the way. So that's my top 10 TV shows of the year and the runners up. There are probably lots of others that I've forgotten, but just having a think today about shows I've watched and really enjoyed, these are the ones that stand out as the ones that sort of broke the rules, if you like, and showed that television still has the capacity to go in different directions. So there we are. Let me know what you thought of this video, what your top TV shows of the year. I'm I'm sure somebody's going to say, what about this? I go, Mamma mia! Uh, but let me know what your favourites were. If you've seen any of the ones that I've mentioned, if what you thought of them, leave a comment down below. Like and subscribe, and uh, I will see you soon. Probably now it's going to be next year. I can't see me uploading anything else new this year, but you never know. You never know. So anyway, if I don't see you, happy new year. See you in twenty twenty four. Like, subscribe, and all that sort of stuff. I will see you soon. Till I do, keep taking the stuff.